estimating the time since the Big Bang has long been one of the most hotly contested studies in the science of the universe, as a definitive answer could help to unlock many secrets of life and our planet's humble origins. While most models have suggested an age of 13.8 billion years for the conceivable universe, a brand new study seemed to confirm that number is significantly off. Imagine our universe is not the youthful 13.8 billion years old as once thought, instead, it could have existed for a whopping 26.7 billion years or even be far older. Let that sink in for a moment, that's twice as old as previously thought. This shocking result is based on a brand new research conducted by University of Ottawa Physics Professor Rajendra Gupta. Gupta brings into the calculus a 1929 theory from Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky. The theory claims that photons get tired as they travel across vast distances and lose energy over the course of billions of years. While this conflicts with observable redshift data, Gupta says that by allowing this theory to coexist with the expanding universe, it becomes possible to reinterpret the redshift as a hybrid phenomenon rather than purely due to expansion. Increasing the universe's age could help explain some long-standing cosmological quandaries as well as some new ones discovered by NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. One of the oldest stars known to science is HD Tin 283, more colorfully called the Methuselah Star named in reference to a biblical patriarch who is said to have died aged 969, making him the longest lived of all the figures in the Bible. More than 100 years ago, Methuselah star was a staggering 14.45 billion years old, with an uncertainty of 0.8 billion years. Such a figure was rather baffling, after all, the age of the universe determined from observations of the cosmic microwave background is 13.8 billion years old. So how can a star be older than the universe? It was a serious discrepancy, says astronomer Howard Bond of Pennsylvania State University. But Methuselah isn't the only cosmological anomaly. Since James Webb first started sending back science data in mid-2022, the internationally funded state-of-the-art telescope has been giving us images of distant galaxies that appear to have formed and matured far earlier than our models predicted. Webb's Hall of Galactic Baby Pictures has proved more bountiful than most researchers dared to dream. Simply put, candidate galaxies in the early universe are popping up in numbers that defy predictions, with dozens found so far. It's enough of a problem that some are calling it a challenge to our entire cosmic timeline. According to the Standard Model of Cosmology or the Lambda Cold Dark Matter Model, after the fiery Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, the universe cooled and energy turned into matter that eventually coalesced during the first few hundred million years, forming the first generation of stars and galaxies. Astronomers thought they had a decent understanding of this process, but Webb's initial results may suggest that stars and galaxies were forming far faster than anyone expected. The telescope had done nothing less than break the universe and upend models of cosmic history. Subsequent data have ruled out some of the more dramatic findings, and new simulations can accommodate at least a few of the strange observations. But some bright, massive, and early galaxies continue to confound theorists, suggesting that our understanding could shift in the coming years. According to Pramada Nutrogen, a theoretical astrophysicist at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, no data at the moment has broken the universe, but there are interesting potential tensions emerging on different scales. Resolving these tensions will require researchers to revisit their fundamental assumptions about galactic evolution. That could mean bringing new ideas to the forefront while leaving others in the cosmic dustbin. Prior to the launch of James Webb, no one knew if galaxies could even form so early in the universe's 13.8 billion year history. At a time when matter was thought to still be sedately coalescing into the gravitationally bound clumps required to give birth to large groups of stars, as Gillingworth, an astronomer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, said at a press conference held by NASA to announce the peer-reviewed validation of the first two candidates, and so, we're wondering, do we really understand the early phases of the formation of these galaxies? This has posed a lot of questions for the theorists. Chief among them is how exactly dark matter guided the emergence of galaxies for the first few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. The cosmos was so hot that gravity could not pull normal matter together to form large protogalactic clumps. Yet, this was not an issue for dark matter, says Jorge P. Ruya, a cosmologist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, because dark matter does not interact via electromagnetic forces. Instead, gravity alone is this invisible substance's master, meaning that in mere moments after the Big Bang, when primordial chaos reigned, 
gravity immediately began glomming together dark matter into large clumps known as halos. These dark matter halos are believed to have acted as gravitational sinks for normal matter, seeding the subsequent formation of galaxies in the early universe. The telltale motions of the stars they shepherd betray their endurance to this day. Such halos still surround galaxies like our own majestic but invisible sculpture of the modern cosmos. James Webb's rapid discovery of early galaxies might be testing our understanding of how these halos form, perhaps suggesting they reached an immense bulk earlier than expected. One explanation might involve the very nature of dark matter itself. Theorists have found that simple treatments of dark matter, in which it only interacts with itself and normal matter via gravity, can accurately replicate large-scale cosmic structure. But nature has no guarantee of simplicity. In reality, dark matter could interact with itself because of an, as yet, unknown force, perhaps via a particle that's not in the current standard model of physics, possibly increasing the speed at which these halos grew and explaining how big, bright galaxies were able to arise so quickly. However, perhaps instead, these halos were simply more efficient at drawing in regular matter to feed star formation. I think this is probably telling us something about how stars form in dark matter halos early on, P. Ruya says. Today, our galaxy produces roughly one new star per year, but Castellano's paper suggests that star formation rates must have been at least 20 times higher in his and Nida's two candidate galaxies. Another web-derived preprint paper posits that Milky Way-sized galaxies could have arisen just a half billion years after the Big Bang, a scenario that would demand star formation rates 10 times higher still than Castellano's estimates. But according to Michael Bourne Colchin, a cosmologist at the University of Texas at Austin, such outsized rates of star formation stretch the boundaries of what is physically possible. If those values are correct, you'd need to have galaxies turning all their mass into stars and forming stars as fast as they could, he says. Researchers have likened the impossible early galaxy problem to flipping through someone's old photo album, expecting to find baby pictures and seeing a full-grown adult instead. With a person, you might just conclude that they are older than you thought. But with early galaxies, you very quickly run into a problem with the age of the universe itself. And that's where Rajendra Gupta's brand new study can come in. Gupta believes that he can explain the conundrum that has long puzzled scientists about these ancient galaxies. Studies by Gupta suggest the universe is closer to 26.7 billion years old, almost double previous estimates. In other words, his newly devised model stretches the galaxy formation time by several billion years, allowing James Webb's impossible massive early galaxies to exist. According to Gupta, that number is significantly off, mostly due to our limited understanding of stretched light waves. As space expands, stretching ever distant in an infinitely growing universe, it becomes harder and harder to quantify how much light we are capable of seeing in the distance. As you may know, the further you look into the distant universe, the farther you look back in time to catch a brief snapshot of the past due to the speed it takes light to reach across the vacuum of space. Some scientific models liken this process to a spring stretching and pulling apart to reach greater heights and distances, and compressing to allow for flexibility. One difficult to understand prospect of most enormous telescopes and deep space technology seems to suggest that redder lights are the oldest lights, having lost their sheen from the difficulty of traveling long distances. As scientists continue to search the deepest reaches of the universe that they can with modern technology, we're frequently seeing redder and redder light. However, Gupta suggests that this red light distinction can be used to determine when the universe maintained more concentrated energy, seemingly snapping the spring into place. Notably, the new idea put forth by Gupta keeps most of the same assumptions in place but offers a few subtle but important changes. First, instead of assuming that only the Doppler shift, the relative motions of the light-emitting source and the light-absorbing observer, the gravitational shift, the difference in the space-time curvature between the emitting source and the absorbing observer, and the cosmological shift, as the universe expands, are at play, Gupta also presupposes an idea first put forth by noted astronomer Fritz Zwicky back in 1929, the tired light hypothesis or the notion that light, as it travels through. Space inherently radiates and loses energy as it travels, becoming tired before it arrives at the observer. Second, instead of the standard assumption that the laws of physics and the fundamental constants behind them are constant with time, Gupta invokes an assumption that others have explored previously, that the fundamental constants, 
the speed of light, Planck's constant, and the gravitational constant, aren't actually constant in time, but vary. In particular, they vary in a special way, changing altogether so that the combinations of these constants that govern atomic transitions and the emission absorption lines that we wind up observing won't change as we look to earlier, more distant galaxies within the expanding universe. However, note that one of the remarkable features of science is that if you have multiple different models that have different underlying assumptions that go into them, there's a scientific way to tell which one is superior. It isn't to look at personal preference, elegance, aesthetics, or simplicity. Instead, there are two key questions that we have to evaluate, which theory has fewer free parameters, and which theory better fits the full suite of data concerning the universe. The reason we look at the number of free parameters is simple, a theory that can make the same predictions as another but with fewer assumptions or required inputs is a superior physical theory to one that requires more assumptions, required inputs, or free parameters. Early on, geocentric and heliocentric models of the solar system had the same number of free parameters, as both ideas needed to provide a series of orbital parameters to describe each planet. If a new planet would have been discovered, neither model would have been able to predict its motion without adding in those new parameters. When Newtonian gravity came along, however, the number of free parameters plummeted with an underlying force governing the dynamics of bodies in the solar system, the force of gravity. A planet's orbital speed, distance from the sun, and motion through the sky were all shown to be related. This increase in predictive power with fewer free parameters is always a scientific indicator that we're on the right track. But it's also vitally important to look at the full suite of data, as opposed to just the pieces of data that are easily fit by your model or preferred theory. In order to be considered a success, you have to consider everything that we observe on all scales, from subatomic ones to cosmic ones, is consistent with and not in conflict with your theory for how the universe works. In his paper, to his credit, Gupta looks at a few important pieces of the puzzle. He looks at the inferred distance to supernovae seen at a wide variety of cosmic distances and shows that not only are they consistent with the standard cosmological model but also with a version of the lambda cold dark matter model that includes tired light, with a model with varying coupling constants and with a model with varying coupling constants and tired light included. While, yes, he's including two extra free parameters in his theory as opposed to the standard model in the form of a tired light component to the universe and also in the form of a set of varying coupling constants, this remains consistent with what we've observed for how distances, redshifts, and brightnesses appear in the expanding universe. In addition, Gupta also notes that by introducing tired light on its own, in addition to the standard ingredients in a standard cosmology, he arrives at a universe that ages much more slowly at very high redshifts. Whereas a standard model universe has experienced only 13.8 billion years since the hot Big Bang, a lambda cold dark matter universe with tired light would be about 6 billion years older, up to about 19 and change billion years old. Additionally, much of that aging would come early on, whereas galaxies seen at the limit of Hubble and near the edge of James Webb's capabilities at a redshift of Z equals 10 would be only 400 million years old in the lambda cold dark matter model they would be about 2 billion years old in the lambda cold dark matter model with tired light. Furthermore, by introducing both varying coupling constants and tired light, he can increase the total age of the universe to be a whopping 26.7 billion years at a redshift of Z equals 10. Instead of 400 million or even 2 billion years, the universe would already be about 6 billion years old, an impressively large figure. Gupta contends that whereas James Webb has shown us galaxies that appear brighter, more massive, and more evolved than had been expected to be seen so early on, his modified cosmology with tired light and varying coupling constant suddenly falls into line with expectations. But, as we said earlier, science isn't about solely looking at the data points that favor your explanation, that's what we call cherry-picking, and that's a surefire way to lead us toward biased conclusions. There are key pieces of evidence that would show up if either light got tired as it traveled through the universe and or if the fundamental constants have changed as the universe has evolved. They would show up in extremely telling ways, and we can actually list a few of them off before looking at the evidence that the universe itself presents on these fronts. Here are four of the most major ones. First, tired light would add a blurring effect to distant galaxies. When Zwicky first proposed the tired light idea in 1929, it was one of the few astronomical ideas that wasn't, 